Good afternoon, everyone. A new heaven and a new earth is actually a promise that we find in many different parts of the Bible. And if we take these words at face value, they seem to be holding out a very intriguing prospect that at some time in the future, our world is in some way going to be reformed or renewed to make it a better place to live. And no one would deny that in many respects the earth that we live on today does really need a makeover. Centuries of abuse by man, especially since the Industrial Revolution, have seriously had a damaging effect on the, the world. And I suppose if we could reverse some of the processes that have so degraded the planet, then that could only be a good thing. Uh, if you imagine, say, the rainforests being renewed in South America, if the deserts could be pushed back and the land brought into cultivation again, if the atmosphere could be cleaned and carbon dioxide could be drastically reduced, if global warming could be halted and the uh, ice caps stopped from melting, and so on, and so on, and so on. That could only be a good thing, couldn't, wouldn't it? A new heaven and a new earth is a very appealing prospect. And as we say, these words actually feature in many different parts of the Bible, New Testament and Old Testament. But I think a degree of care is necessary. If we're to understand correctly what we're being shown, you see, it's dangerous, isn't it, to assume that... Uh, these words automatically are literal words. Are these things literal or should they be seen as metaphorical or symbolic in some way? And really when we're in the book of Revelation then we'd have to say the tendency is to think of things here as only being symbolic because it's a symbolic book. It's a book of sign and symbol. And if you take that first verse of the chapter that we were reading, Revelation chapter 21, and this vision that the Apostle John saw of a new heaven and a new earth, it points that way, that we should take it symbolically. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth that were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, when you think about that, a planet wouldn't work without sea, would it? It would be completely uninhabitable. The sea, the oceans drive the weather, and the weather produces rain, and without rain on the earth, then life is impossible. And if you look at verse two, when John was being shown this new earth, you see what he actually saw. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And that picture is repeated in verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, words like that can't be taken absolutely literally, can they? It's a metaphorical picture, a parable, uh, a parable picture, if you like. And uh, I think it's really talking about a new state of affairs rather than a totally renewed planet in literal terms. It's talking about a new way of living, living to a different moral standard. And I think the, the references point that way. In verse 2, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And in verse 10, he saw that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of God uh, from heaven. And this city is likened to a woman in all her finery, adorned with jewels, waiting for her marriage to her, uh, her bridegroom. It's very, very symbolic language, isn't it? Now, let, let's try and keep the ideas in our mind, the picture that we're given there, and go back into the Old Testament to see where these, these words had their origin. And I want to take you back to Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 62. 
You see, we've been reading about the holy city, Jerusalem, and God's purpose has always been clearly identified with that particular city. We're told that it's the place that he has chosen of all locations to place his name. We're told that the eyes of God are on that city and on that land of Israel from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And that purpose of God for Jerusalem comes out very clearly here. Isaiah 62 verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth and the Gentiles or the nations shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now it suggests that here is that new Jerusalem that we've been reading about in the book of Revelation and it's called a city of righteousness isn't it and a city of salvation this is the holy Jerusalem because it's associated with righteousness now these words can't apply to Jerusalem at the present can they although the name Jerusalem means city of peace or habitation of peace it's been a city that's never really known any lasting peace it's been a city of strife and division between Israelis and Arabs particularly but nevertheless God's affection for Jerusalem and his intentions for this city are made very clear just go down to verse 3 thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God now that's very much like the language in Revelation isn't it a city bedecked with jewellery Verse 4, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah. Now, you might have a margin that says that that name in the Hebrew means my delight is in her, and thy land Beulah. And again, the margin says that name means married. For the Lord <coughs> delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now when you read these words, you can see why the book of Revelation talks about this symbolic city coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And what I think God is doing is really trying to put a, a very appealing picture in our mind, something that we find very attractive. And if you um, turn over a page or two to chapter 65 of Isaiah, we find the same picture is being filled out uh, and made even more attractive. Verse 17 of uh, chapter 65, God says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. So again, here we have God's new heavens and new earth. And it's all centered round about Jerusalem and his own people. And it presents to us, in the rest of this chapter, an absolutely wonderful picture. Is it real? Is it symbolic? Well, let, let's just read down from verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain nor bring forth for trouble. 
for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now, if you wanted to paint a picture of an idyllic paradise, a new way of living, I think it would be along those lines, wouldn't it? Because it's a picture presenting extended lifespans, satisfying, peaceful and fruitful labour, weeping and sorrow removed. And all this life is being overseen by a rich blessing from God. It's talking about an earth renewed, <coughs> literally, and a new way of living, literally. So in short, I think what we're being given in this, this Old Testament passage is really the Old Testament view of the gospel message that we have in the New Testament. It's the same gospel, it's the same good news of God's intention to establish a kingdom where these conditions will be introduced. Now it's no different from the New Testament uh, gospel, as we say. If you'd like to keep a, a finger or a marker in Isaiah and just look briefly at the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3, we find here the words of the Apostle Peter when he was preaching in Jerusalem very shortly after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. He'd accused his own people, the Jews, of having killed the Prince of Life when they crucified Jesus. But he accepts that they'd done it in ignorance, ignorance of who he was as their Messiah and in ignorance of the need for his sacrificial death. But he says to them in verse uh, 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now that's interesting because Peter talks there in verse 19 about times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. And I think it's something to do with that picture that we've just been looking at in Isaiah chapter 65. And he says that these things in uh, verse 21 will constitute the restitution of all things, the, the restoration of all things that the prophets have been speaking about. We've been looking at the Old Testament prophet's picture, haven't we, of an earth renewed, a delightful uh, situation, an idyllic state when uh, Eden is renewed and all things are made as they were in the very beginning when God pronounced them very good. Now, of course, our willingness to accept that this is actually God's intention to make all things new depends entirely on our willingness to accept that God made all things in the beginning, that he's the creator of the heavens and the earth, and therefore he has the power and the right to create new heavens and a new earth. It would be a nonsense if we believe that the present order came about purely by chance to talk of these things. They depend upon God's creative ability, don't they? That he can be a recreator. This is an absolutely uh, crucial point. If you've still got your finger in Isaiah, let's go back to chapter 45. God has and always has had a long-standing purpose for the earth. And it's fundamentally linked with his position as the creator. And that's what he says here in Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now I would say in that verse, in a nutshell, you've got the whole purpose of God. He's created a beautiful planet and he's created it to be inhabited. I'm minded to uh, talk about 
that view of the Earth that we first got when the astronauts were <coughs> travelling to the moon and back. Astronaut Buzz Aldrin, particularly on uh, Apollo 11, returning to the Earth from the barrenness of the moon on which he had been walking only a day before, said that the Earth was like a jewel in the blackness of space. And you perhaps saw those wonderful pictures. He says it's a very precious home. And God created this beautiful planet, as he says there, to be inhabited. It leaves the question, though, doesn't it? By whom? Not obviously by millions of people who are ignorant of him and his existence and power. And not by generations of individuals who are born, who live 70 or 80 years and then pass off the scene. God desires something far more lasting and more fulfilling than that. And so if you just cast your eyes further down this chapter, at the end of verse 21, you see God makes the declaration, there is no God else beside me, a just God and a saviour. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Now that... It's quite telling, isn't it? That's an appeal by God, not just to his own people, the Jews, it's to all the ends of the earth to look to him for salvation because there's no salvation anywhere else. Verse 23, he says, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. So that's what God wants. He wants a population that will acknowledge his power and authority as the creator and willingly want to worship him and to seek after him and to respect his ways in righteousness. Now I use that word purposely really for a number of reasons. Righteousness is uh, not a word you hear a great deal of nowadays, is it? It's out of fashion, presumably because it's a Bible word and people don't read the Bible very often today. And so it's perhaps inappropriate for our society. But notice how often God talks about righteousness. There in verse uh, 23, he says, his word has gone out of his mouth in righteousness. It will not be gainsaid, it will not be flouted. Verse 24, he's, surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. I'll go back to verse 7, still talking about God's creative ability. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. So you, you have references again to God, God's creative power demanding righteousness. And it's coming down from heaven, uh, figuratively. <coughs> and it's springing up out of the earth, figuratively. Uh, it's all part and parcel, really, of the new heaven and the new earth. Let's go to the New Testament again. And this time to the second letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This concept of a new creation runs all the way through the New Testament. And it's designed really to help us understand better God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's designed to help us to appreciate how we as individuals can have a part in it. And in this chapter, the Apostle Paul was explaining the need for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, why he died on the cross, and the consequences of that sacrifice for the believer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, 
that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So the death of Christ emphasizes the fact that humanity is a dying race and that he died for them, then they have this responsibility to change their lives and to live unto him. This is that new way of living that we talked about at the beginning, this new state of being, especially in moral terms. I suppose really put it, putting it another way, it's talking about repentance, isn't it? Turning round and walking in a new direction. Verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. He's talking about now we live a spiritual life, not a life of selfishness after the flesh. Verse 17, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So this is the new creation, a new start for individuals who will appreciate what the sacrifice of Jesus has done for them. And it's effective in two senses, really. The new man or the new woman in Christ, their status is changed and also their motivation in life is changed. Just reading on, verse 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that's that's fairly complicated language, isn't it? But it's telling us that the, the new man, the new woman in Christ, is brought closer to God by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls it this process of reconciliation, which we're uh, famil familiar with in industrial terms, aren't we? In industrial relations talk about reconciliation of two parties that were at odds with one another. So the status of the individual is changed because God, he says there, he no longer reckon, reckons their trespasses unto them or imputes their trespasses to them. He forgives them their sins and he doesn't count uh, sin against them anymore. Now this is all of God. Uh, verse 18, all things are of God. It's God's new creative work writing, we won't turn to it, but writing to the believers in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul put it this way, he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has foreordained that we should walk in them. This is the new personal motivation of God's new creation, living to uh, higher standards than before. Or as the Bible puts it, walking in righteousness, walking in God's ways and reflecting his heavenly standards. When we were back in uh, Isaiah's prophecy looking at the new heavens and earth there, uh, I forgot to mention it, but that is a term of address that God uses of his own people. He calls them the heavens and the earth. Uh, it's a sort of metaphor, really, for the nation. Uh, and presumably, God used it because as a people, they of all people had the potential to aspire to heavenly standards. Sadly, as we know, in many regards, they were a disappointment to him. And that's why we find numerous references in the Bible to uh, removal of the heavens and the earth. There are passages that talk about them being rolled up as a scroll or folded up like a, a disused garment and put on one side for the time being. Now, I mentioned that because these sort of allegories, this sort of allegorical language that God uses of people is worth bearing in mind now 
if we go further on in the New Testament, actually to our final quotation in the second letter that Peter wrote in chapter 3. Because Peter's talking here about a coming day of the Lord. And the, prop, the top of your Bible probably says that. In my Bible it says, of Christ's second coming. He's saying to his people, he's writing to Jews, not to doubt about this second coming, not to be sceptical. He says um, in verse uh, 4, that there were, no, verse 3, he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But Peter says, look, they're wrong, they're forgetting. Verse 5, they, this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. What he's saying is, look, you're forgetting that in the days of Noah, God flooded the earth because of the wickedness of men. So don't scoff at the idea of God intervening once again. And he, let's read on verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, whether we see that as literal or, or uh, symbolic depends on how we look at the judgments that came on the heavens and the earth in the days of the apostle. You think of the nation of Israel, they were put to the sword by the Romans. It was a terrible time in Jerusalem when the temple was set on fire, the whole city was destroyed, and the people were eventually led away into captivity. So there was a terrible judgment by fire. Uh, that was a day of the Lord. But reading on, there is another day coming, says Peter, verse uh, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's being long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's a, a warning there, isn't there, that the coming of Christ necessarily will bring severe judgments. Severe ju judgments for God's people, the nation of Israel. And as we say, it had an earlier fulfillment shortly after Jesus' ministry. In AD 70, the Romans destroyed the city and brought the nation effectively. The heavens and the earth ceased. They were rolled up and put on one side for a little while. But Peter's ultimately looking forward to another day of judgment when the Lord Jesus will come again, as my Bible says, of Christ's second coming. And that could well have as drastic an outworking as it did in the past. When the Jewish heavens passed away, there could be a terrible time in store for that nation once again. We, we, we have to leave that uh, in the hands of God, really. But the warning stands for us, doesn't it? Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Conversation there means manner of life. What's your manner of life to be like, be, being that you know that there's this coming day of God. Verse 12, he says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent 
that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. It's quite uh, dramatic language, isn't it? It's uh, quite daunting, really, this prospect that uh, faces the earth when God sends his son again. A new heavens and new earth we look for in verse 13. Are we looking for these things? Are we those who are going to constitute this new heaven and new earth ourselves? Uh, and be a part of this new state of affairs or are we going to be part of that heaven and earth the system as it exists now that's going to be swept away just as an aside we remember that first quotation in the book of Revelation from chapter 21 verse 1 what John saw the new heaven and the new earth and the first heaven and the first earth being passed away, and there was no more sea, he says. Now that's a symbolic picture. Scripture tells us, uh, further back in Isaiah's prophecy, that the wicked are like the troubled sea, casting up dirt and mire. So when we talk about a new heaven and a new earth, and there being no more sea, you can see it's a symbolic picture of an earth in which dwells righteousness, a world of salvation, and no more sea, it's righteous because the wicked have been removed. It's a wonderful picture. Now we asked the question right at the start, didn't we? Uh, why is our world in need of a, of, of a makeover? And we said because the systems are being ruined by, by men, men plundering the earth's resources. The greed and selfishness of man has made the planet almost uninhabited. Its future is uh, in the balance, to say the least, if you haven't got a confidence in these things. It's all through man's greed, his corruption, vested interests, desperate to make a, make a profit out of everything. When these things are controlled by a righteous ruler, when the governments of the earth are governed by the Lord Jesus Christ from Jerusalem he's going to reign on David's throne which was in Jerusalem and hence you can see the importance of Jerusalem in what we've read from uh, Revelation it coming down not literally but being a place of righteousness ruled by a righteous king then the earth can be transformed can't it through righteous laws and justice, the earth will fulfill that idyllic picture that we had in Isaiah 65. That will become a reality simply because evil and corruption and selfishness and greed has been removed. The earth will then truly reflect the glory and beauty of its creator. So, a new heaven and a new earth, God's invitation to us is to constitute us as part of that new heaven and new earth or the new heaven particularly and the prospect before us is to live on a renewed revitalized richly blessed new earth and it's a wonderful promise and it's our appeal really that we take hold of it whilst we have opportunity <laughs>